not to be overly bossy, but would you um, silence your, your phones, if you would? I've got to do mine, too. How's everyone doing? Good? So far, so good? Yeah? Great. Um, w when I started blabbering yesterday, um, I talked a lot about awe and reverence, right? That's how we started this, this whole discussion. Um, and I think it's hard to imagine an animal that can inspire more awe and reverence than any of the great whales. Um, and whales have been part of the college's DNA for a, a long, long time, starting with my mentor, Steve Katona, and Allied Whale, our, our research that goes on at Mount Desert Rock, um, photo identification collection of humpback and finback whales, the stranding program. It's, you know, we, when we say, hey, meet us somewhere at COA, we say, meet me at the whale skull, right? That's the, the entrance to the college. Um, so when we sat down to put this event together, we knew that we had to shed some light on the North Atlantic right whale and the situation there. Um, we knew it would be a tough topic. Um, whenever you're talking about an animal where there are only 350 or 370 individuals left on the planet and where the conservation and restoration of a species comes head to head with massive and important economic and cultural forces, you know, that's, that's a difficult conversation, but we've got to have those kinds of conversations, so we're, we're having it. Um, we know that entanglement and ship strikes um, have put the North Atlantic right whale in a really precarious place. Um, the question then becomes, in restoring that species to a viable population, how do we do it in a way that doesn't also inspire massive difficulty in other sectors? Um, the entanglement between right whales and lobstering is, industry is, a, I think, a remarkable and a remarkably difficult human ecological problem. That's what we do here at the College of the Atlantic. It blends science, politics, economics, anthropology, and technology in some really interesting and, and challenging ways. And so to guide us through that discussion tonight, we've assembled Scott Krauss, Andy Spaulding, and Genevieve McDonald. And I'm not gonna introduce the three of those uh, individually because we're welcoming Fred Bever here, and Fred's gonna do that. Um, Fred is a public affairs journalist and for the past 20 plus years has been up here in the New England area at National Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public, and he's done a lot of work at the nexus between entanglement of right whales and the lobster industry. He's also written an award-winning piece on aquaculture in the Gulf of Maine, and I'm excited to announce that he's got a new gig coming up. Um, beginning in August, I think, is that right, Fred? Um, he'll, he'll be at just down the road at the MDI Biolab as the director of communications there. So he has agreed to teach for free at the College of the Atlantic <laughs> in exchange for, for being here, and we, we really appreciate that, that Fred. That's, that's great. Um, just keep the coffee coming. Keep the coffee coming, right, right. So I'm going to turn it over to Fred and enjoy the evening. Thank you all. And to, to, to what Taryn just said, I would add that this, this uh, sort of entangled fate of lobstermen and whales also includes fishing communities up and down the eastern seaboard uh, from, from Nova Scotia to Florida. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, this, we have sort of the most intense touch point for this issue, although Canada has also seen its uh, emergence as a more important area for that. Uh, so to tell you a little bit about our guest, Scott Krauss uh, in the middle here is, the, uh, is, is a 1977 graduate of the College of the Atlantic. Uh, he is a Professor Emeritus from the New England Aquarium's Cabot Center for Ocean Life. He uh, has been, maybe still is, the chairman of the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium, which brings together uh, scientists or researchers from all over the world uh, to, to uh, understand and ponder the whale's situation. Uh, and he also has served many years on what's called the North Atlantic Right Whale, or 
maybe it's the large large whale. large whale take reduction team, which convened stakeholders from all the different communities involved, the lobster industry, politicians, and the scientists and the conservation groups to try to find consensus on solutions. And I've been watching this for five or six years now. It's not easy. Uh, but they do try hard. He also was the co-editor of this book, which has been a real education for me. Uh, in 2007, it's called The Urban Whale, uh, because I think these right whales, they swim pretty close to shore. We see them a lot off our urban coasts. And uh, this was kind of the, the, the foundational document uh, with uh, many scientists who were young then, and are only a little older now, uh, who uh, really started creating this very vibrant body of research around uh, the right whales. I see Amy Knowlton, one of the other authors, is here in our audience. Um, so uh, that's Scott, Scott Krause. Uh, I think we give him a little, little chair. <laughs> uh, and then the same year that this, he co-edited this, 2007, is the, the year that Andy Spaulding graduated from the College of the Atlantic. Uh, I got that right? Mm -hmm. uh, he is a lobsterman, a fisherman. He's from Bust Buston's Island, uh, where he grew up, which is off of Freeport. He told me that uh, since, since he was a kid, he knew that lobstering would be his way of life. Uh, and I th uh, when he was here, his senior project was rebuilding a lobster boat. He still is in the industry. He's lobstered offshore, inshore. Uh, and he fishes out of Buston's Island now, where he's also the harbor master. Uh, and uh, we'll learn a lot from him about what it's like to, to be a lobster man because it's a boom and bust kind of a uh, situation for them. And finally, someone who also, oh, it's for Andy <laughs> Snyder. Uh, and then uh, Genevieve McDonald, who is uh, from here, uh, from Bar Harbor. Uh, she's been living in Deer Isle for a while, where she represented uh, Deer Isle and neighboring communities in the legislature. Uh, she is a fisherman herself. She just recently, uh, did you give up your lobstering no, license? No, no, no. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, I've only been out of the fishery that. for one month and only okay. temporarily. <laughs> uh, uh, she's, she's, uh, I blew my engine. <laughs> she, she was on the Marine Resources Committee in the Maine legislature. She's deeply involved in the issues that we're talking about today and many more uh, that involve the oceans uh, and the communities that, that live and prosper thanks to them. Uh, she uh, is also now a strategist or a cons you're on the staff of Predi Strategies where she consults on ocean issues there and she's matriculating at the USM Law School as well. Uh, Genevieve McDonald. So Darren set up the basic problem, uh, which is this interaction between, you know, the various strands of human activity that affect the natural world, uh, you know, our search for, the prosper, for to, to be able to prosper, to do commerce, to eat food. Uh, it brings in politics and science and policy. It also brings in history, and I wanted to turn to Scott first to give us a little bit of the natural history of the right whale. We, we, we call it the right whale I think because 18th and 19th century, I've heard the different stories, 18th and 19th century whalers thought it was the right whale to hunt because you find it close to shore, uh, it's, it feeds along the surface, so it's, it's easy to find, and soon after dying, they tend to float. Uh, they, they don't necessarily float, but if you're, if you're a whaler, they're the right whale but to hunt. But tell us a little bit more about what they were like before the whaling community. Okay. Came along. I brought a prop because right whales are weird looking. I mean, everybody thinks of whales as beautiful, magnificent, intelligent creatures. And in many of the encyclopedias that I grew up with, the whale was actually depicted this way because the smile works that way. But the whale actually upright belongs in this position. <laughs> right whales, imagine this without fur. It's furry, it's, it has no fur. And it's about 50 to 55 feet long. The white spots on the head are called callosities, so you can tell individuals apart. The patterns are very distinctive for every, just like if you lived in a village of a thousand people, you'd know everybody by their face. They can do the same. They are uh, rotund, uh, so an adult right whale will be eight to 10 feet in, 
it, if it were lying on the beach, it would be that, that's how thick it would be. The tail is about 12 to 15 feet wide, and the flippers are each, they're a little stubby on this guy, but they're each about uh, 10 to 12 feet sticking out from the side of the body. So think about it as a ship. This is a very wide ship. Um, they are unusual in the baleen whales in that they're called skimmers, like a grain combine. They feed with their mouth open. This is supposed to represent the baleen that hangs down. It's one of the reasons they were so valuable and the right whale to kill. Baleen was the predecessor to plastics. They were used in corsets all through the 1800s and prior to that. This is also the species that led to whaling worldwide. The first whales that were taken by the Basques uh, probably a thousand years ago, and there's some evidence that there may have been some whaling prior to that by both the Norwegians and uh, possibly in the Mediterranean, although it's a little uh, sketchier. Nevertheless, a thousand years ago, these guys figured out that they could launch from the beach with a boat and a harpoon, harpoon the animals, and bring them to shore. Now, they started in the Bay of Biscay, at least the fishery that we know about, at about AD 1000, and they are, um, they probably targeted calves because the moms wouldn't run off and the calves were easier to tow to shore. Nevertheless, it turned into quite a fishery and the Basques were the premier whalers right up through the, 18, uh, through the uh, 1600s. In the 1500s, they started a whaling operation out of Iceland and then they moved over to Newfoundland and there was a substantial whale fishery actually out of Newfoundland by the Basques uh, for about, about 80 years. So anyways, and then uh, whaling was banned by the League of Nations in 1935. Uh, for this species, and at that time in the Western North Atlantic, there are various estimates, all of which are unreliable, but the possible possibility is that there were only about 60 to 100 right whales left uh, by 1940. So what we think has happened since then, <clears throat> and most of this is based upon what we know from healthy right whale populations in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a, it's a different species, but very similarly they look the same and they're pretty well closely related. These whales give birth one calf, a single calf, every three years. So they're slow to reproduce. It takes about 10 years before they reach sexual maturity. Um, they have an unusual mating system where single female mates with multiple males over time. Um, and those uh, mating groups are quite dramatic, can be as large as 40 animals at a time and you do not want to get your boat in the middle of that. Um, been there, done that. <laughs> Still here to tell a story. <clears throat> um, the, <clears throat> the population, from the time uh, we started looking at them in the early, late 1970s, the population was probably around 200 animals and it has grown right through 2010 to about nearly 480 or so right whales at the time along the east coast of the United States. Uh, so it was slowly recovering, not as fast as you might expect. Some, uh, there are some peculiarities. There's a fairly high degree of inbreeding, but not enough to slow down reproduction. Nevertheless, reproduction varied highly from year to year to a point where people were starting to wonder, well, what's going on here? Um, but there, uh, there are very specific feeders on a very small organism known as Calanus finmarsicus, which is a little copepod about the size of a grain of rice. It, occur, it occurs in very large clusters, bunches of it. And, um, and you can see it in Cape Cod Bay in the springtime. The ocean will turn red in patches, and that's Calanus finmarsicus. There can be other copepods that uh, also show up in those big clusters, but right whales like those uh, little Calanus because each one is about 60% fat. It looks like a little stick of butter. And uh, right whales like that, and they put on a lot of weight. So they start feeding in Cape Cod Bay. They give birth uh, when they have babies. They give birth off the coast of Florida and Georgia. They travel up the coast to Cape Cod Bay, Great South Channel, east of Cape Cod. And they feed there for the springtime. And then in the summertime, it used to be that they went to the Bay of Fundy and to the Nova Scotian Shelf. And some animals every year would disappear. We didn't know where they went. Now, uh, the Bay of Fundy has been abandoned by right whales. The Great South Channel is largely empty of right whales. 
The Scotian Shelf is only occasionally visited, and m about 130 right whales go into the Gulf of St. Lawrence each year. The remaining 200 whales, we don't know where they go. Still a big mystery. Uh, remarkable, given the degree of uh, research that's gone into this species, that we still don't know where they go in the summertime. And same thing can be said in the wintertime. We can account for perhaps 100 right whales in the winter. Where the rest of them are, we don't know. Um, so the population grew from 1970s right up through about 210, and then there was quite a dramatic shift. And I think, and we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. Yeah. And I, Andy, I, uh, I wanted to ask you. You, you um, I think you got your captain. You became a captain in 2014, right? But well, you've been fishing longer than that. Uh, I got my license in 1994, so you can kind okay. of say it about that. But I went out on my own um, in 2014. Once I graduated COA. Uh, I pursued my career of being a commercial lobsterman. Um, I worked as a sternman for about <clears throat> six years on a boat, both inshore and offshore. We'd spend the winter off of uh, Jeffrey's Ledge and sometimes further out. Um, Andy, I'd, I'd like to ask you, particularly when you're fishing and since, since the 1990s, what have you had to do basically up until this year? Because there, there are federal, various requirements that the federal regulators have put on the industry in order to try to protect right whales from entanglements with the, with the rope that you use. What, what does that mean? What it's, you uh, do? it's been a progressive change over, well, decades now. Um, the big first change was to get rid of uh, float rope as opposed to sink rope. And when I say sink rope versus float rope, it's when you put a piece of rope in the water. Uh, float rope was mostly made out of a uh, plastic-based material, and it will float. So how traps used to be attached to what is called a ground line, the ground line that goes along the bottom, how it used to be is you'd have a trap and then you'd have your float, rep, float rope, trap, float rope, and they'd make these big arcs. And the purpose of the float rope was to keep the rope off the bottom of the ocean. So it didn't get chafed, it didn't get caught in rocks, and it worked very well. However, they found that um, right whales uh, would go along and they would get tangled in, in, the, in the loops. Am I, is That's that correct? Right. Yeah, you got it. So they started to uh, prohibit float rope being used in the fishery and replacing it with a ground, or sinking rope. So that way the, all the lines would stay on the ground and so any whales would go by would not get tangled in the big loops that going up. Well, when I started at COI, I started studying this issue because I knew it was going to be related to what I was going to be doing for a career. And Back then, they said if we just get rid of the float rope uh, and put breakaway, 600-pound breakaways on the buoys, that would be a big help to um, reducing entanglements. Unfortunately, that has not resulted in the reduction of entanglements that we've seen. The industry has switched over to all uh, sink rope for um, ground lines, and which is in turn makes it so the, the ropes do get worn out. There are tanglements in between rocks and they get tangled with each other and other fishermen and stuff. So there are some issues with that. And as more regulations have been, been put into, in, into the f industry to try to reduce um, the risk of entanglements, now they've implemented such things as breakaways in the ropes. Now there's, when I talk about ground line, that goes between traps on the bottom, but there's also the end line, which goes from the start of the str string of traps up to the buoy. And that is now the focus largely about to try to in reduce entanglements, is to reduce the number of vertical lines in the Gulf of Maine. <clears throat> and to, to do that, they've implemented what they call trawling up. Now where I fish, we fish about mm, average between five and 10 traps per string or trawl, it's string or trawl, kind of interchangeable terms. But further east in Genevieve's air neck of the woods and down east around here, it's more likely that you're gonna be running into what they call singles. And what a single is would be one trap, one end line, one buoy. There is no ground line. Now you can imagine fishing the state maximum of 800, you're gonna end up with 800 end lines floating around and you multiply that by 5,000 licenses or however many it is in the state, you end up with a lot of ropes. So 
to reduce the number of vertical lines in the water, they've been trying to implement what is called trawling up. So instead of, say, 10 traps having 10 end lines coming up, now you have a string of 10 and only two uh, lines vertical in the water. And on each one of those vertical lines, now what they have um, us using is a, a 1,700 pound breakaway. And that can come in the form of a plastic uh, loop which you splice rope into. And the idea is that if a whale is entangled, it would break at a breaking point of 1,700 pounds for each one of these plastic clips. Or you can use a smaller diameter of rope, about 5 16 inches, and put that into your end line because you want strong lines to be able to pull up your, pull up your gear, and especially if it gets tangled with someone else, a lot of strain, waves coming up, pushing, pushing the boat up and down. So it has a weak link into it. Now that causes concerns among the fishermen about the, the, um, just how dangerous that can be because so, you don't want things breaking. So Andy, I want to return to, because w- w- some of what you're talking about just went into f- effect on the water yes, just the, this May. Um, I want to ask you, before this year, yep. uh, did you have, like, like, at the top of the buoy there was a breakaway that you had to put in, right? Only in certain areas. Okay. I never had to use the Morayos because I fish inshore, which means inside the three-mile line. Yep. And there are some other ex- uh, certain zones in the state where I think they're required, but where I fish in my neck of woods in Casco Bay down around Portland area, that was never required because it was the lack of whales down there and the, the shallowness of the water. But before, there was nothing. There was no breakaways. It, it was just you had your rope on there, and it was very strong. So I imagine that would cause issues if whales became entangled. So I'm going to ask Genevieve now to tell us what first looks like you have a point you want to make. I do. So I want to jump in here because I did take some notes about the history of what we've done to conserve Mm -hmm. um, conservation measures that we've enacted to protect North Atlantic right whales. And I had to take notes. So I used to eat, sleep, and breathe this issue. But frankly, it was emotionally unhealthy to spend that much time thinking about these regulations. This has a dire impact on the future of the Maine lobster industry. So I, it's a privilege that I have because I have another skill set that I'm able to go do other things like speak with you fine folks here this evening. So please excuse me with the notes. So the Maine lobster fishery does have a really strong history of stewardship, both in the sustainability of the resource and in efforts to protect North Atlantic right whales. The first whale protection measures went into place in, well, I should first say the first fisherman-led conservation measures for the resource went into effect in 1874. The first conservation measures to protect North Atlantic right whales went in place in 1997, and that was eliminating floating rope at the surface. We started gear marking in federal waters in 2001, 600 pound breakaways in the initial trawling up requirements in 2001. We removed 27,000 miles of ground line in 2009, removed 3,000 miles of vertical line through trawling up requirements in 2015, Mm. We implemented unique and expanded gear marking in 2020 so that we would have a unique mark for Maine, both in our inshore and offshore fisheries. And we recently implemented a 60% risk reduction, including additional trawling up requirements and the use of weak points in the line. Each of these steps created additional expense and safety hazards for Maine fishermen. We've had a very high 93% compliance rate. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of the law. We certainly want to do our part to reduce our risk to North Atlantic right whales and protect this, you know, amazing species. You know, I've heard a complaint in the conservation community uh, several times over the years that Maine uh, did resist gear marking. One of the very difficult things in this whole debate is identifying where did a whale get entangled. Uh, they, they, you know, it might be somewhere near where they turned up dead, but you don't really know. Uh, and only recently, in the last year, has a very, much more robust gear marking regime come into effect here in Maine and in other fisheries. But, but uh, Scott, has that been a concern for you that you could have known better where the whales were being entangled uh, had there been better gear marking until recently? I think, I think early in the take reduction team process, knowing where the whales were getting entangled would have been helpful. Now. It's not, I'm not convinced that, I appreciate all the gear marking. We will learn a lot about where whales are getting entangled from gear marking. We've got some excellent, uh, believe it or not, forensic experts on rope. And there are 
groups of fishermen from both Canada and the United States that evaluate entanglement ropes. So we're learning a lot more about it that way. It's helpful to have marking, but in fact, um, as Scott Landry, who runs a disentanglement team out of the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, says, any time there's rope in the water, it's a risk of some sort. So that's, that's a challenge that, we, that every fishery faces. So I will say, as a Maine lobsterman, I think it's imperative that we know where whales are getting entangled. I mean, we're looking down the barrel of some sweeping changes that will have lasting consequences for our coastal communities. And so I don't want to operate in speculation and unknown. Because right now, aren't we facing about a 98% risk reduction? We are, over the next 10 years. years. Yeah. So just to be clear, the, when gear turns up on right whales that have either died or been entangled and disentangled, we can identify it less than 12% of the time. And that means that, and we know as well that, you know, they're encountering uh, 20 to 50 entanglements per year, but we know from the scarring data that the actual number of entanglements is probably four to five times that. So the percentage of entanglements that lead to retrieved gear where you can identify it is going to be extremely small no matter what. And I, I worry about that for fishermen and for everybody else because it's, it's a sample size problem. If you get two ropes back you can identify, you can't conclude that, oh, it was all there on the, off of the point of Gloucester because that's where that rope was marked. It's and going to be a very difficult problem. And I think surveillance of where the whales actually are and have been is going to be an issue and uh, of figuring out where the lobstering is going on, where the fishermen are. Uh, right. And there are some <clears throat> new efforts underway that, that can improve our vision. The hardest part of this for me is not being able to talk nonstop for an hour about <laughs> this issue. <laughs> <laughs> let's, say, let, let's, let's put up... Uh, the, I'll, I'll listen. <laughs> you guys have two hours, right? <laughs> The, the, the first slide, that I, I just want to put up something that might be a little bit of a talking point, um, which shows the, 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 the hill of improvements in the whales population up until early in the 2010s. And we, were talk we started out talking with Andy about the, the kinds of measures that had gone into effect, uh, uh, sinking ground lines, getting rid of those root, root lines, some trawling up since 2015, as Genevieve mentioned. Um, but Scott, why is that? Why, why, what, what happened here? There was a steady progression of improvements uh, from 1990 uh, up until you know, 2011 or so, when there were, there were, there were, the, the numbers were getting close to 500. Uh, yeah. what, can we say, oh, those new regulations helped? Well, it's interesting, because as I put, just put this together, that the, if you look at the period from 1997 to 2000, the population actually had a slight decline during that time, largely due to a decline in birth rates. Okay. And that triggered all kinds of alarm bells in the agency, and that's when you went to sinking ground line, mm -hmm. and there was a big push to try to do something more. I think it's important to remember that the take reduction team, in spite of all of our good intentions, we discussed and the agency then implemented ideas that were never experimentally tested. We were, everybody was guessing, fishermen, scientists, agency members alike. And so it's not clear to anybody that the measures that we took during that time led to fewer entanglements or not. Okay, so and that so that incline, it may be just that conditions were better, whales ate more, they had more babies. I know the fishermen, they look at that steep uh, increase in population to say, look, it's working. Our conservation measures are working up to that point. Right. But then it changed and it didn't, and the fishermen didn't, there was no change in the conservation measures. So right? we do know some of the things that happened in 2015. So 2015 was an unusually high mortality event in Canadian waters. There were 12 entanglement deaths and eight ship strike deaths of North Atlantic right whales. Right. Up until that point, because whales migration pattern has changed, mm -hmm. chasing their primary platonic food source, brought them into the Gulf of St. Lawrence in numbers, maybe not the first time ever, but in numbers that were unprecedented. Right. And at that time, the Canadian fishery didn't have any regulations in place to That's protect right. the North Atlantic right whale. They do now, 
but there's still more work to be done. And we'll, and in a second, I'll have a slide that will illustrate precisely that. Um, I'm not done. Well, let's, During let's, that let's, same time period let's go back. Let's go back. in the U.S. waters, <laughs> there were zero known okay. entanglement deaths and six vessel strike deaths. So we need to address this vessel strike piece. Well, let me let me just say one thing, yeah, which one is thing, that now, actually I'm going to interrupt and say climate is <laughs> climate is playing a role here. What's happening is yeah. the Calanus finmarchicus that Scott mentioned earlier, this very fatty copepod, tiny little crustacean, has become less abundant in the Gulf of Maine and the Bay of Fundy. There's right. emerging evidence of that, and there appears to be a big storehouse of this f forage food up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So you can conjecture that. That's why the whales are showing up there, why we're finding them there more than we used to and finding them less in the Bay of Fundy than we do now. And it, is, it appears to be related to growing warmth of the Gulf of Maine, which is warming faster than most of the, the large bodies of water in, in, in the world. Um, so that's part of why you see this cliff with the whales population going down is because they went up to Canada and there were not the Canadian policy wasn't ready for it uh, in terms of where ships would go and in terms of whether their very uh, strong snow crab fishery as well as their lobster fishery was setting traps and putting vertical rope in the water. Now, if we go to the next slide, you see that in the tallest bar there is 2017 when, when there was uh, 17 whales uh, found <coughs> dead in that year. The orange is the, the whales that were found in Canadian waters. The blue is the whales that were found in U.S. waters. Uh, and so things got pretty dire there. Um, do you agree, any of you, that this is about warming water? And oh, yeah. No question. Yeah. I don't see how you can. Yeah. The Gulf of Maine uh, in 2010 there, actually there was a couple of papers that showed that it started warming faster than any other place in the North Atlantic. So that explains the movement of animals to Canada. But uh, two things I want to point out about this graph. We just had a paper out a few years ago that showed that of the detected mortality, of all mortality, the detected mortality represents only about one third of the actual mortality. So when you see these numbers, when you see four, probably 12 whales died that year. And that's, and, that, and that's not just natural death that's related to we, human activity? So it's hard to know, uh, but when you look at all the deaths that are actually d discovered and retrieved, the only natural death we've ever seen has been neonate mortality. There are no adults that have died of natural causes. No juveniles. Neonate is when there's an undernourished calf who, right. who doesn't make it. Yeah. Okay. Now how often would you come across a, a whale that would die of not natural causes? I mean, can you find, if one washes ashore, can you determine that it was natural causes, or was, is it just undetermined even if it had evidence of entanglements? Well, the folks who take them apart, God bless them. <laughs> I um, did that. I participated in that once. It's a terrible job. Yeah, yeah, Very you throw your clothes out after. Yeah, this. I did. <laughs> yeah, I know you've got to do it. Um, are really good at this. They're experienced pathologists and veterinarians. There's a lot of activity uh, that happens in the laboratory afterwards to look at uh, sources of death. So that's, you know, a lot of times, like in Canada, when they had these whales dying, they were towing them in from 30, 40 miles offshore, and they would get to the beach, and then someone would have to work them up. They might not get to them for two, you know, after they had died. Having on the whales, whether it's, we haven't seen any death this year. We haven't seen any. You, is it too soon, Scott? Oh, yeah. I, okay. I mean, even after a given year, uh, I always work. You have to remember these whales can live 50 to 100 years if they uh, live a natural life. So determining, and I will say one other thing, is that females can withhold or delay reproduction if food is bad. Uh, missing a couple years of calving is not critical for this species as long as they're not killed off from other, okay. you know, other things. So they can, they can go for a while through bad times and poke around and look for new food sources and that's probably how they found their way to Canada. Remember that only, uh, only about 130 of the right whales are going to Canada in the <laughs> summertime. I don't know where the rest of them are going. So. so, these new rules went to effect this year 
Uh, they were fought hard by the, the lobster industry. Uh, there was a brief stay uh, as one judge was looking at it, but eventually they were put into place. This is a billion dollar industry. But the, uh, what you're talking about for the uh, stuff that was put in place, are you talking about the closed area off the coast? So off the there was, Maine? okay, so off there's the a, a restricted zone uh, of about a thousand square miles off of uh, the state of Maine that went to, was supposed to go in effect into October. It was delayed a little while uh, where you can't fish with traditional gear that relies on rope. Uh, then there are also new gear marking rules and there's these, this trawling up where you have to put more traps on each rope line so that there's less rope in the water. And uh, there are weak links, uh, which are it's rope that's 1,700 pounds breaking strength that adult whales can break is the, is the idea. And you can also put leaks that in that will help that happen. What I wanted to ask you guys is, so we can't quite say what the effect on the whales has been yet. What about on the industry? What about on the lobster fleet? Uh, we've been through now the rules from 2015. Now these new rules, what's it like out there for, for the, the fishermen? I'll start off with that. This morning I was out hauling some traps, and I had a string of traps caught on some rocks, and I snapped part of the rope off. So I need to go back and try to retrieve that with some sort of, what I have is a drag. It's basically a bunch of chain with some hooks on it. But I've been hearing that uh, up and down the coast that when you put extreme strain on it, the 1,700 pounds will break. And it's not necessarily the rope itself that'll break, it's how it's attached. Um, there are certain knots that we are required to use to weaken the length, uh, the wake, the, weaken the rope itself, and that'll break at the knot. And so it gets expensive when a new trap is going for over $200 a piece right now, and you got 10 of those on a string. I mean, it starts to really add up. And at right now, at a time when the industry is in crisis due to uh, extremely low prices and extremely high overhead, it's, it's, um, it's very hard to adapt to having to buy new equipment um, if it's even available. We had a real hard time with that at the beginning of this year with supply chain issues and having it available enough. So much so that the government uh, had originally set a May 1st 2022 implement date, they have scaled that back and say, okay, we're kind of, it's going to be a gradual enforcement kind of thing because they understand that we were not able to totally comply in that amount of time. And the cost of new rope and replacing lost gear is high. There have been programs in the federal government and some efforts at the state level to provide funding for it. Uh, that money goes quick because you use your gear and ropes part off, they get worn out, gear gets lost, you gotta have to replace it. We also haven't received it. So there is some funds that were allocated by Congress to help fishermen, yeah, to help fishermen convert. Um, so there's been supply chain issues that were significant. There has been a lack of availability of weak links, particularly the plastic pieces. So in the, um, the weak points, as we'll call them, not to be confused with the weak links that we used previously, so it has been problematic. There wasn't enough time to trial them extensively. Um, a lot of ghost gear has been created, which is an additional environmental concern. Also, ghost gear continues to trap for an amount of time, so it's an economic hit. But there is more work and opportunity to be done there, certainly. Um, I, I think it's less about what we've done to date and more about what happens in the future. So jumping from 60 to a 98% risk reduction is huge. So this is supposed to happen over the next 10 years. The government has said this. It's a matter of how quickly the actions start being taken to get to that 98% uh, reduction level. So and, and ghost gear, by the way, is just gear that there's no one has control over it. It just floats around there in the, in the ocean. It's a hazard to not just the whales, also the other fishermen. And there are, in, with the Maine lobster gear, just lobster gear in the American and Canadian fishery, there are certain things where there are uh, clips you put on escape vents that'll rust out after a certain amount of time. So whatever gets in the trap can get out eventually, but that takes some time to happen. But uh, still, more junk in the ocean, especially when all the traps are going in, there's a good amount of plastic in there. And then you start running about microplastics, which is an epidemic worldwide too. So we're trying to, we don't want that more of that also. Is this like an existential threat to the industry, yeah. Genevieve, or is it really just a matter of learning new ways? 
So there is a certain amount of adaptability and resiliency built into the lobster fishery, but a 98% risk reduction, that is a death knell for the main lobster fishery and for our island and coastal communities that depend on it, for fishing families like ours, for infrastructure businesses, for all of our shoreside infrastructure. It is, we've maxed out on the tools that we have available to us without more collaborative research, more research and development, and more conversation around what we know. We need to stop working in unknowns and start narrowing down on what we know. And there's also, One of, oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. One of those things is research and development for satellite tracking. With only 350 known individuals, we should be able to know where right whales are in real time. They've had success doing this in Australia and New Zealand. We also have a data gap on the lobster fishing side. But as of January 1st, 2023, we have mandatory harvester reporting, which will provide spatial data. It will go all the way to the beach for the entirety of Maine's lobster fleet. So we're going to rise to the occasion and have data that shows where we are. We need that same data from where are whales. So let me just push back on that a minute. Let me just ask you a question. Let's suppose, first of all, right whales don't, are very grumpy about being tagged, and they tend to scrape them off. They go to the bottom and scrape them off. We have, uh, I think, we have tagged 60-something right whales over the last 30 years. And one of them, one of those tags lasted four months. The rest were usually a month or less. And most of them are only last a day. So, but let's assume that we were able to get a tag that worked. The battery's gonna run out, so you're gonna have to re-tag them every year. And let's assume that three whales swim into Casco Bay. What are you gonna do? Well, what are we gonna do? That's why we have to continue collaborative research. Well, no, I mean, that's, if that's you, the, but that's even the if thing. you knew where they were, you can't, guys can't pull all their gear out in, an, in a day. So, knowing where the whales are is not probably going to help you. And hasn't that, that been much. tried with dynamic area management before? Yeah, like and, it, and it failed because of exactly that. It was hauling the gear problem. Yeah, I mean, and if... So say that was a total, that was a big I mean, because a whole bunch of things could come into play with that. So say, let's say three tagged whales came into Casco Bay, and the word went out that, okay, these are here. Well, just because they're Casco Bay doesn't mean what part of it. And when you have each fisherman very centralized in one little area, so if, if the whales are off Harpswell, well, the guys down Cape Elizabeth, they don't need to worry about it. The guys in Freeport don't need to worry about it. But that day, what happens if they swim up there? Then all of a sudden, everyone's scrambling, and then weather comes to play. What if it's blowing 40 knots? Right. You can't get exactly. out to do That's that. That's what happened to dynamic area right. management. What if it's a Sunday? You can't haul it a Sunday. Well, so. Or imagine, imagine that you're able to watch them in real time, and you see a right whale coming at you. What are you going to do? Right. So is Canada doing less the dynamic management, more seasonal restrictions? They, they shut down a fishery block, and it's, I don't know, 100 square miles or something, if, a right, if I think it's one right whale is seen within it. Right. And they shut it down for 15 days, and they continue surveillance, and then it remains shut if a whale is sighted again, but if it's not, they open it up. Is that not subject to the same difficulties? Of some guys just can't haul their traps that fast? Well, it's the snow crab fishery, which yeah. is different. Okay. Uh, they're mostly singles, uh, big traps, and that what's, that's what made that fishery particularly risky for right whales. I mean, you gotta remember, right whales are perfectly designed to get entangled, right? They swim around with their mouth open all the time when they're feeding, and then their tail is 15 feet wide. Imagine swimming through uh, or driving a boat through Frenchman's Bay with a propeller 15 feet in diameter. Just think about that. Genevieve, so. you, called it probably a, is. <laughs> you, you called it a death knell. I did. Is that as true for the, the majority of Maine lobstermen who, by the way, Genevieve refers to herself as a Maine lobsterman, uh, which is a whole other discussion about. Uh, if it makes uh, you uncomfortable, you can call me captain. <laughs> 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 um, for, for the, the rules are less draconian, they're less stiff on the majority of, the, of the, the fishery that's within three miles of Maine's coast. Right. And they get progressively more strict as you get farther offshore, where it's more likely that whales w would be. Uh, so is it really a death knell for the entire industry? Yes. Is it for part of the industry? No. Why not? So there's a, couple, there's a couple end games here. One is that we push everybody offshore inshore, so you have a lot of crowding. There isn't an abundant enough resource to support that many fishermen operating in the same area. As Andy can imagine, if everyone offshore in your area got pushed inshore, 
the resource is not there to sustain it. And we're talking 10 years from now. The so the landings that we're seeing now won't be the landings that we see in 10 years. And if predictions are accurate, then we'll see even a further decline in the resource, particularly in the submarine. The other end game is that it becomes a consolidated fleet. And whatever protections we put in place, say we go, we haven't talked about ropeless fishing yet. So we create exclusions that mean only, only the wealthiest, only the highliners, only we consolidate into a corporate fleet. A quick note, a highliner is a boat that's got so much lobster that it's bringing in that its waterline is low, that the water's come way up. Uh, so, so either our system creates a series of have and have nots, we end up with crowding, we end up with a curtain effect, we end up with dependency on a resource that isn't there to support that many vessels. So if we, if we head towards this in 98, risk reduction figure. People are going to go out of business. It could mean trap reductions, longer closures, bigger closures. Uh, well, there, now you're talking about something that's a little bit more dynamic. I mean, so some of those ideas may have some substance and are things that we should be talking about in our risk reduction conversation. Um, conservation equivalencies, tailoring risk reduction based on not just the locations of whales, but the density of gear, whether it's inshore or offshore. I don't think we've explored all of the possibilities yet, but we need to be having a more tailored conversation than this, you know, one approach fits all across the Gulf of Maine. And we'll get to the question of on-demand uh, uh, tra trap I also want to get to the question of commerce, because we've talked about science. Well, when, I just want to ask Andy, first of all, do you see it's, you know, the sort of Damocles hanging over your head uh, f uh, seven years from now. Absolutely. Everyone is operating with, okay, we're working today. I don't know what's coming down the pike. I mean, this is, it's this, this dark cloud that's looming over us that one court decision could shut the entire American lobster fishery down. And even if there was no, there wasn't any lobster traps being hauled in America, it still doesn't apply to Canada, because Canada does not follow our laws. They are not subject to the endangered species laws of our country. And risk reduction is not the same as prevention. Like, it's, it's, we're, it's two different things, and preventing entanglements is different than reducing the risk of them. And I don't see how one can be achieved without... I don't see how, how closing one, or just... How do I say this? Getting rid of one industry does not guarantee the survival of the species. And, it's, and we're talking about vertical lines, and as, as you were saying, the restrictions for offshore are more, um, they're more intense than the ones inshore, but it's being painted as a broad stroke and saying, okay, well, Lines are imaginary on charts, and they're, the whales don't follow them. So just because we have this three-mile line and say, okay, on this side of it is okay, we need these, these regulations, but this side we don't, well, when the whales come over there, we have to consider that everything is, or a, as it is considered right now, everything is in play. So, you know, I have traps in 10 feet of water, and as you're saying, a whale would technically beach itself before it could have got there, but the government considers that that gear in 10 feet of water just as deadly as something in 600 feet of water. And it only applies to, to um, fixed fishing gear in terms of like lobstering and gill netting. There's been a very large boom of aquaculture now off, off the coast of Maine, and they are not required to have the breakaways um, that we are. And they have these large uh, facilities to grow oysters, to grow kelp, uh, to grow mussels, uh, to grow scallops. And I would think that those, those lines, those end lines down from like the rafts down to the moorings would also be a risk to the whales. I mean, that's to say nothing about the, the, the moorings for boats. I mean, we're talking about giant chain over there. I don't know whale would just bump into that or not. But it, I feel like it kind of needs to be applied to everything. You can't just say, okay, well, we get rid of all the end lines for lobster gear there's no problem. Well, there's always going to be a problem. So I... So that, I mean, that is one of the things that the Maine Lobster Fishery is asking for, is for fair treatment and for all stakeholders to do their part. So not having us being tasked with 98% risk reduction when all of these other potential hazards, risks, um, aren't addressing it as adequately or as stringently as we are. I mean, the last documented entanglement attributed to Maine Lobster Gear occurred in 2004, and there are no known right whale deaths attributed to Maine lobster gear 
ever. Now, that's, granted, those are known and unknowns. That's, that's a point that many in the industry and outside of it, the political supporters of the lobster industry here make time and again. And sometimes they don't make it quite as precisely as you just did, uh, referring to known or documented. Uh, do you think that the, the idea that uh, there hasn't been a documented uh, injury or mortality, there hasn't been uh, you know, severe harm found since 2004 that you've traced directly to the, the main fishery, do you think that means that the risk is less? I think it means that there are a lot of things that we don't know and that the question we should be asking is how far do we push a fishery based on speculation and unknowns? So over the course of the next 10 years, as we work towards this figure, we need to be doing a lot more work on identifying what we do know. Scott, there's been a lot of uh, interest in the conservation community around the idea of on-demand, just getting the rope out of the water by having a, a trigger mechanism so you could, you could identify where your trap is and you could trigger it to the surface and then a rope would come up from the bottom and then you could haul it in. Do you think that's realistic? Well, <clears throat> So it's exactly what Andy said. There's risk reduction and then there's prevention. And risk reduction involves weak links and uh, there's actually a whole slew of options that might be applicable to a lobster fishery. But the prevention is really what people are after when they talk about uh, releases from the bottom. And you know, one way to think about it is, I suppose, if you, were to go in, if you were going to invent the lobster fishery today, you'd probably use your cell phone and you'd have an app and everything would pop to the surface. But we didn't do that. So retrofitting the entire fishery over to something like this has to deal with several things. One is that is very technically challenging is knowing where your neighbor's gear is on the bottom. And so, because if you don't know that, you're going to lay across them, and then you're going to have weak ropes trying to haul it to the surface, and now you're trying to haul yours, your neighbors, your other neighbors, and, every, and there's, you know, thousands of pounds of gear coming off the ocean floor. The ropes won't support that. So, ropeless fishing could work in some places. It may work better offshore because you got a bunch of traps on a single string. If you had 50 traps on a string, you might be able to put a ropeless at both ends, and the cost per trap then goes way down when you have a lot of traps. And those transponders can be visualized, uh, at least people think they can be visualized using standard depth finders. So, and they're less crowded out there. So guys could see one another and avoid setting across one another. Whether they would, I mean, there's a lot of reluctance, obviously, because electronics and salt water, how many of you have any experience with that? <laughs> Genevieve, you, you uh, brought up, the, you know, looking for solutions. Is this one that, that you and your colleagues in the industry can see as in any way possible? So it's not a solution right now. Um, we'll put it that way. So for a couple right. of reasons, the gear marking requirement, you can't see where other people's gear are. So there's a technological answer that we need there. Um, it's not available on a commercial scale, so even if you know, a mandate went to place that we all had to switch to ropeless gear and people were willing to do it, there aren't enough units available. And it's also not cost, um, I, I would say not cost effective, cost exclusionary. So there's three things that make the main lobster industry successful. One is sustainability of the resource. One is diversity within the fleet. So, you know, kids in 16-foot boats right up to people in 60-foot boats offshore. And the other one is profitability, because you have to be able to make a living at it. So when we take away any of those facets, it really puts the lobster industry in a precarious place. And right now, ropeless gear, it's not affordable for everyone, and so you start to impact diversity. And when you start to impact diversity, you move away from that day boat, small scale owner operator fishery into who can afford it. Diversity of the fleet. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to ask a question about the ropeless buoys, which I first asked Sean Todd back in about 2004 when I was sitting in turrets taking his fisheries management class. Teacher here at College of the Atlantic. <laughs> um, so we know that nothing mechanically works perfectly forever. Things break down, people make mistakes, or they, things just break. I, nothing la cars don't last forever, you need repairs, things aren't going to work out. So what happens, we implement on-demand ropeless buoys. So what happens is, say, a fisherman goes out, sets his ropeless buoy systems, and one of them malfunctions, because it's going to happen. And a rope pops up, sitting there, a right whale comes along, and gets entangled and dies. Who gets in trouble? Is it the fisherman, even though they are 100% following the law? 
Is it the manufacturer for making a faulty product? Is it nobody? Because if it's nobody, what's the incentive to use it? Couldn't you just go out there and have them all just pop up? Be like, I put them in there and then just popped up and I don't know what happened. So there has to be some sort of consequence for that. And I've been asking this question now for almost 20 years and I have yet to receive an answer from anybody. And, and that needs to be addressed. I think is one of the real questions here, the interim. Between now and five, 10 years from now, what will be the solution since this on-demand technology, even the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says, won't be ready for at least five years for commercial deployment. Sorry. Um, this this the, became a private so, conversation. So, so We're so speculating sorry. here. So, <laughs> talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Cocktails are over the hill. <laughs> So-called so ropeless technology or on-demand technology, it's clear, won't be ready for at least five years for commercial use. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, a little closer to, the, to, to your... Uh, Mouth there, Fred. And so, in the interim, how do the conservation community, the scientific community, and the industry find a way through that's that's in any way viable? I mean, we're in a, a fortunate position where this fisheries management is really being decided by litigation, which is you know deeply unfortunate and never the way that anybody wants to have things go. Um, I know that Scott will continue his work on the take reduction team. I know that there's a lot of, and I hope there's a lot of smart people working on this issue and trying to think of remedies that are palatable that will help balance conservation with commerce. But it's more than commerce, right? It's also culture and our future and the sustainability of our coastal communities. So I'm really counting on the people that are at the table to come up with some viable solutions because the, the alternative is unacceptable. It, it can't go that way. You think about me without a lobsterman in every cove. It's a different place. It is. Um, well, I, I think that um, there's some recognition about this dichotomy between um, prevention and risk reduction. And the risk reduction strategy has been to make weaker ropes. Right whales, they're big. And so they can handle entanglements in singles and doubles and smaller fishing gear without any trouble. Uh, they tend to carry it around for a while, knock it off, and then we see a scar form. But it generally, most whales will survive uh, those kind of lesser entanglements. And that's one of the reasons that the inshore fishery, because it's mostly singles and doubles, got exempted from a lot of the large whale rules for so many years. The offshore fishery, and I will say this is one area where we have a lot of concern about the way the latest round of take reduction has taken place, and that is the trawling up idea that you put more traps on a line, all of a sudden makes each string much heavier. Now, you, in order to retrieve that, either your ground line or your vertical line is gonna be stronger, and now if a whale gets caught in that, then there's a much higher chance of dying. We have uh, my colleague Amy Knowlton, who is here, actually did a study on breaking strength and found that the biggest problem for right whales was actually heavier rope and heavier gear. And so when you go to heavier gear, you're putting the whales, not a, it may not change the risk of entanglement, but it changes the risk of death. So that's, that's one way to think about this, is that if there's a risk reduction strategy that could be applied across the fishery until there's better technology available, that is, the, that is the weak rope direction, I think, for starters. We just have a couple of minutes left in our first hour, uh, and I think we have about 15 <laughs> minutes after that for a conversation with the audience. But so, Genevieve. So I did just want to touch upon commerce and the meaning of the lobster industry to the state of Maine and to our communities. Please. So we, I mean, we've talked about science and conservation and the various things that we have done and I think things that we hope to do in the future to protect this species. Um, but just to put it in perspective, of what lobstering means to the state of Maine, both in terms of numbers and in sense of place. So it's the second most valuable fishery in the nation. In 2021, we landed 108 million pounds. The value of the fishery is 730 million in 2021. 73 million of that was in Stonington. So Stonington is a hub where the top landing lobster port in the United States, and we like to argue in North America, Canada hasn't you know, put up much of a fight yet. But we are a hub from all of our surrounding communities. So we buy from these offshore islands that are really 100% dependent on the commercial fishery. And it's, we look at all of this as data and these numbers, um, but they're people. 
You know, there are people, there are communities in Down East Maine. You know, I live an hour from the closest Walmart. We don't have a lot of other economic opportunity, particularly the further east you get. Not every town can and should be a Bar Harbor. And so if you come to Stonington, you'll see a real working waterfront. When you look out at our mooring field, there are no sailboats, there's no recreational boat. It's actually in our municipal charter that there can't be. So you're really in a place where lobster means more than just dollars. It's our heritage, and we need it to be our future. So we have to come up with solutions to this issue that will allow it to continue. I'd argue it's also a very unique culture that yes. is uh, you know, special, in my opinion, obviously. And, and I guess, oh, sorry, go ahead. And for the state in general, I mean, it was on our license plate forever, and uh, the tour, it's such a draw for the tourists, um, the fishing villages, all the, how many, how many places you sell selling lobsters between here and Ellsworth? You know, dozens. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge commerce even for the people who don't even fish. I mean, it's a draw for tourists to come here. They want fresh seafood, so. It's a $1.5 billion economy. One, one dollar paid to the vessel becomes three dollars on land. So that's significant, particularly in such a rural part of the nation. Scott, just in our last minute here, you and your career have seen the whale population bounce back from numbers that, the right whale population bounce back from numbers that are lower than they are now. How do you feel about their prospects, given this entire complex of stakeholders well, who are This is a really tough odds? one. You know, this, this is extremely uh, challenging. Most fishermen in Maine are, you know, they want to be shown that there's a problem. And most fishermen in Maine will never see a right whale. Even professional observers miss 50% of the right whales that are in the waters beneath them when they're flying surveys or doing boat surveys. They're very difficult. So I believe the fishermen when they say they're not seeing them. But that means that they don't believe that there's a problem. And there, right whales are creatures of habit. Even though they have abandoned the Bay of Fundy as a feeding place, they travel through the coastal waters of Maine on their way to Canada. Scott, do you think they'll make it? So, I have no idea. Okay. I think it's a. I think it's an open question. This is a big experiment. Thank you very much, Scott Krause, Andy Spalding, and Genevieve McDonald. And now we can turn to the audience here at the College of the Atlantic uh, to see uh, about some questions and conversation. And I think I'll just leave it up to Sean to. I don't have much trouble with volume. Um, hi, you guys. Uh, I'm a teacher at the high school here on the island. And if I say something that is offensive, it's only my own ignorance and stumbling to find the right way to say it. So there's two things that came to mind. One, Scott, is, I mean, we're sending these, we're sending ships or whatever, vessels to Mars. We can't create some sort of tagging system that these whales can't knock off. That seems shocking to me that we can't improve on that. That seems like... I mean, we have technology coming out of everywhere. I don't know whether there's not a huge amount of research on that, but as you were talking at the beginning, I kept thinking that. So that's one thing that comes to mind. And the other thing that comes to mind as a high school teacher, um, and again, y y I'm, I'm doing the devil's advocate based on what I see. So I'm teaching these teenagers, many of whom, of course, have the heritage of the fishing industry in their families. A lot of these kids, I, I worry about their understanding of the issue. These kids are making more money than I make. And every fishing family I know, and I, I know I sound abrasive, I know that, and it's only because I don't know how else to say it. But the fishing families that I know, they're living way higher off the hog than I am having a master's degree and teaching for four decades. So. This is the part that I struggle with. I mean, fundamentally, we have too many people. There are just way too many people on this planet. And so not everybody can do what they always could do. It's happened in industries all throughout history. Look at all. Look at all. It's OK, girl. You're allowed to <laughs> <laughs> But Small you know, community. mill towns. <laughs> All of, all, many, 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 many industries have come and gone, and I'm not suggesting that we do not need the fishing industry. Please don't take that. I just wrestle with this. It's like, 
the, I, I don't know. It just there's too many people, and how can we continue with this? I mean, what's the end game? I guess is yeah. So I'll take that second part of your question. So one of the things that is fantastic that we have done a very good job of in the lobster fishery, fishery is managing the resource. So the reason that there can be a next generation of fishermen is because we still have an abundant resource. And right now that is predicted to continue to occur, at least into the next generation. So there are impacts of climate change, certainly. We're seeing lobster settlement shift to colder, deeper waters. Um, this may at some point become an interaction issue. You know, it, it plays into this larger conversation. But while we still have this, you know, we're so fortunate to have this incredible resource of lobsters in the state of Maine is why we can have a next generation of lobstermen. Can you fish, can you, can you fish a similar number of traps, or sorry, a smaller number of traps and make a similar profit. Is I wish that David Cousins was here to it's, talk about that. So <laughs> that is something that comes up for consideration. Um, so looking at the chart, you know, in regards to the mortalities of the right whales, comparing the US mortalities with the Canadian mortalities, it looks like Canada, whenever they're present on the chart, they're a lot higher, but they seem to, you know, have some absence or some years where there isn't any mortalities, which seems a bit peculiar. Do we know if that's like a luck of the draw? Maybe there are moratoriums that were used or in place those years. Um, just curious about, you know, uh, 2013, 2020, and 21 and 2018 to see maybe there's something within those years that occurred that could be utilized to further prevent additional mortalities and all that jazz. Curious if any discussions have occurred or, you know, thoughts on that. Scott Krause. Well, the surveys uh, in the early part of this period indicated that there were fewer right whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It does seem to have been a shift that increased in numbers up to about 2015, and you start seeing the numbers in the Canadian um, mortality side go way up. What I think we don't know, there's substantial surveillance in Canada now. They send a lot of airplanes flying over a lot of oceans, so it's unlikely they're missing much. It's possible that after 2019, these closures that they implemented are reducing the um, entanglement kills, in fact, to zero. And that I, do, I can't tell you about the ship kill ratios, but I want you to remember that these numbers are probably, probably only represent about one third of the actual mortality in a given year. So what you don't know is what you don't see. And, it could be, who knows, maybe the Canadians are killing off the other eight that are missing from 2020. But we don't, we have no idea. That's the, uh, that's the main fisherman's hope. Aggressive. <laughs> it is. I wasn't going to go that far, but I mean. Right, more questions. Hey, Fred, we've got one all the way over to your right, and this will be the last question. Okay, thank you, Sean. Hello. Um, so another kind of question about a threat to the right whales and it seems like we've talked a lot about the lobstering industry and how it kind of seems like they're being heavily targeted as a threat and um, I guess we're just wondering about the windmill farms that have been like proposed and the license for the research array is permitted to harm up to 20 whales and it seems a little bit unfair that sure. there's these industries in the Gulf of Maine that um, are are being put in that are threatening to whales and um, like they have giant mooring chains that they could swim into and have who really? knows what kind of sound about floating farms? influences uh, their movement and um, if there's an industry that is potentially going to cause conflicts with whales that is being put in yet we're trying to reduce the reduction in the same waters like how how is that going to be addressed? So this, so this is this is a very rich topic and will be going forward. Uh, we do have something of a ringer here. Uh, Thought we were going to make it all the way through and we just did it. <laughs> um, so I'm the fisheries liaison for New England Aquaventus and Pied Tree Offshore Wind. Um, there have been no licenses issued to anyone in the wind industry in the Gulf of Maine that allows them to do anything with marine mammals or whales. 
Um, Scott can probably speak better to this than me, but my understanding is that right whales will not be able to pick up and take a turbine with them. So while there are anchor chains, it won't pose the same kind of threat as gear that can be mobile. Um, certainly, this is a conversation that we need to continue to have and that we are having with NIMS and NOAA and various entities as we look to the oceans for the development of renewable energy. Um, so it, stay engaged. And it's a very novel field of research right is. now. Uh, and so there's a lot more to be learned. There are incidental takes being allowed, uh, which is the term for saying it's okay if you injure an endangered mammal. Uh, in some other areas of the country further south of here, uh, and so this will be a continuing conversation. Scott? I would, I would say that uh, there's two types of wind farm anchoring systems. One is pile driving and the other one is anchoring with a big mooring. Uh, the anchoring with the big mooring is experimental still, only being done in Europe, and we don't really know much about it. The pile driving is where the takes occur in uh, wind farm development south of Massachusetts, and those takes are acoustic takes. They're not actually going out and hitting the whale over the head. It's, and there is some concern about acoustic uh, noise from pile driving, driving or causing whales to avoid the area, but the takes are probably not even close to the scale of like seismic exploration, which we've been using off the southeastern United States in the Gulf of Mexico for about 50 years. So we're not even in the same ballpark. And I will just add that we do know that there is no pile driving for the installation of floating offshore wind. One thing to keep in mind as we think about this going forward is the, the scientific consensus is that of the, with fewer than 350 of uh, the endangered uh, North Atlantic right whale left, you can lose fewer than one a year before you start heading them on the road to extinction. Uh, it, recently, there have been as many as three a year, and so it's a very small number that you can actually allow to, to die or be seriously injured without heading to extinction. Right now, as of this year, we haven't seen any uh, entanglement. Uh, we've seen one entanglement. We haven't seen any deaths yet. So everybody's going to be hoping for that to continue to be the case, I think. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, and uh, Nobody threw anything. Yet. <laughs> Genevieve McDonald, Scott Krause, and Andy Snyder. Andy Spaulding. Thank you. You know, you know, we were trying to find a solution here. You know, I thought we were going to be the, able to end the day and walk out of here like, okay, we got it. We didn't quite get there. But I don't know, when I was watching the conversation, I was always watching like, when was Scott nodding his head a little bit when <laughs> Genevieve was talking and, and vice versa. And there were those points, right? So that's, that's, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. There were those po points. I'm, I'm really excited for that. Yes, by midnight after the drinks tonight, we'll be fine. And there will be drinks um, right up at the Center for Human Ecology. And of course, tomorrow, uh, we talked a little bit about plastics. We're opening the day with plastics tomorrow with our, our colleagues from Oceana, Andy Sharpless and Jackie Savitz. And then tomorrow evening, we have our collaborators with the National Geographic Society, and that's Brian Scary and Jill Tiefenthaler. So please come back tomorrow. Loads to do still. Um, we'll probably be a gaggle of people asking you questions, so be prepared, and thanks for coming, everyone. Good night. Thank you.